Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, Russia pledges to pull back from Ukraine's capital, but can they be believed? We've not seen signs of real seriousness. What to make of the promise towards peace and... How did you get out? Incredible stories of survival and loss from cities under siege. A CBC News exclusive, sexual misconduct claims allegedly covered up in the Canadian Navy. This whole experience has destroyed me. A senior officer said she was pressured not to report harassment, and it's caught on tape. The U.S. approves a second booster for those 50 and up. I would like to have added protection. So do you need a fourth dose? We'll put that to Pfizer's CEO. And the Queen pays tribute to Prince Philip with Andrew at her side. I think it's an image that's going to prompt a lot of uh, discussion. The royal choice raising eyebrows. This is The National. After 34 days of war, this may be the first moment there's hope of de-escalation. Russia has announced it will reduce its operations in Ukraine's north, notably around the capital, Kiev. It's the latest result of ongoing peace talks. But Ukraine's president is skeptical. The tension around Kiev remains. There's no ceasefire anywhere. Russian attacks opening fresh wounds across the country. Salima Shivji shows us how those facts alone have left Ukrainians with more fear than hope. Hundreds of kilometers from the peace talks, survival is top of mind for the millions of Ukrainians displaced. Air raid sirens, even in the relatively calm west of the country, shatter the quiet. The fear of more bombs is ever present. Snezhana Shevchenko is just days from giving birth. My mind is scarred by the bombing, she says. I'm terrified the shelling will hit again, even here. What she escaped, she calls hell. Kharkiv is in ruins after enduring near constant bombing for weeks, like Mariupol in the south, battered and burned, and nearby Mykolaiv, the target of a missile strike that killed at least a dozen people. It's a world away from Istanbul, where after a more than two-week pause, the negotiating table was again full, four hours of talks, leading to Ukraine's negotiating team offering to remain neutral, to not join military alliances like NATO, but only if the country's security is guaranteed by countries like Canada or Turkey. Russia's response was a promise to radically reduce its attacks on Kyiv and other parts of Ukraine's north. It was presented as a gesture of goodwill to move talks forward, only it comes as Russian troops were already stalled on the outskirts of the capital. Pushed back by Ukrainian forces, a promise that could be a ploy to retreat and regroup, some analysts say. And whether Russia will even do what it says it will is doubtful, say Western leaders, skeptical and wary. We'll see. I don't read anything into it until I see what their actions are. We'll see if they follow through on what they're suggesting. There was a lot more progress coming out of these talks than anyone expected going in. Still, it's far too early for much optimism on a day of missile strikes and heavy fighting on several fronts. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Lviv. As you just heard, there are concerns that Russia's intent to shift the focus away from Kyiv may be less about retreating and more about setting the stage for a renewed offensive. According to Ukraine's military, Russia is moving forces away from Kyiv and other fronts in the northeast. And for Ukraine, that offers a tempting opportunity. Ukrainian forces have already begun to take back territory from Russia near Kyiv, including the important suburb of Irpin. But there's a risk here as well. For days, Russia has been digging in, laying minefields, hoping to slow Ukraine's counteroffensive in the north. And in the meantime, Russia's got a chance to break through in the east. Towns like Izum and Severodonetsk, hotly contested. And troops that Russia took away from the north could reinforce its offensive there. Now, Russia has been accused of brutality 
and violating international norms throughout its invasion. Today, Canada announced more help for the International Criminal Court to investigate alleged war crimes. An RCMP team will be going over. These are uh, dedicated members who have the experience, the skills and the expertise uh, to help collect evidence and to marshal a case uh, to bring charges on war crimes or crimes against uh, humanity in a subsequent prosecution. The ICC launched its probe earlier this month. At the urging of Canada and dozens of other countries, the RCMP will also conduct its own investigation into possible Russian war crimes under Canada's Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act. Now let's turn to a CBC News exclusive. Two female senior Navy officers are now leaving the service over its handling of sexual misconduct. They accused the commander of Canada's Atlantic Fleet of refusing to hold three male subordinates to account. The women say those male officers mismanaged and even tried to cover up a recent misconduct case. Ashley Burke has their stories. Lieutenant Commander Nicole Dugas says she used to wear her uniform with pride, but after the Navy's handling of her sexual misconduct case, can't bring herself to put it back on. It would have been easier to simply continue to endure the sexual misconduct and the sexual harassment rather than to report and, and go through that. Dugas reported her boss, Commander Ian Bai, abused his power in the fall of 2020 as a senior officer in charge of administration at CFB Halifax. She claims he was drinking at lunch and sexually harassing her, including... Trade-offs for um, sexual activities. Attention. Commander Perks, fall! Dugas says Commander Patrick Perks witnessed Bai make inappropriate sexual comments at the mess and claims Perks joked she asked for it. Dugas also alleges another senior officer, Commander J.J. Doyle, tried to pressure her into not reporting it. She recorded part of that call. And I'm willing to go and verbally beat him up about it to get him back in line so he understands how the severity and how serious this is. Let me deal with it. Dugan did report, and Bai was charged with making only one inappropriate sexual comment. Attention. He was later released as unsuitable for further service, but the commander of Canada's Atlantic Fleet declined to punish any of the other senior male officers who Dugas claims attempted to cover up the case. She recorded a call with him. I honestly don't believe that there was um, malicious intent in any way, um, and therefore when we talk about holding people to account, uh, I think it's important that we balance the intent um, against the impact. Rear Admiral Brian Santarpia told CBC News an investigation found the proper procedures were followed, but acknowledged they failed to meet Duga's needs. She's now ending her 12-year career, saying she's lost all trust in the institution. If you're not holding people accountable from that top level, nothing is ever going to change. Her assisting officer is leaving after more than 30 years of service over at two. I can't, as a senior officer, continue spouting what I now know is lies, that, um, that it's safe to report. So Ashley, what did now retired Commander Bai say in response to all of this? Well, Andrew, he admitted to making one inappropriate comment at the mess, but he says it wasn't directed at anyone in particular. And he said that all of the other allegations have either, quote, been misconstrued, taken out of context, or are false. And what about the other senior male officers involved? Well, Commander Perks said that he reported the allegations as soon as he learned of them, but Dugas says that he witnessed multiple inappropriate comments earlier that month, and he didn't report it until he found out that she was going to come forward and report it. An assistant deputy minister with the Defense Department is now investigating all of this. Okay, Ashley Burke, thank you very much. Now, the federal government is expected to include more money to boost Canada's military spending in next week's budget. Finance Minister Christian Freeland will deliver this year's spending plan on April 7th. It will be the Liberal government's first budget since the federal election. It's also expected to include details on a number of social programs announced as part of a deal with the NDP to keep the Liberals in power until 2025. Now, the federal government tabled its latest climate plan as well today, with billions of dollars for new investments and cuts in the building, transportation and oil and gas sectors. It's an effort to slash emissions by 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels 
by the end of the decade. The Prime Minister called the plan ambitious and achievable, but as Hannah Thibodeau explains, reactions are mixed. In a province heavily focused on oil and gas, Randall Benson owns a company that installs solar panels and electric vehicle chargers. He thinks Ottawa's plan bodes well for his business. It means uh, an, an influx of interest in these technologies, um, especially with gas prices being so high. So I think it's a great, I think it's fantastic. There will be over $9 billion to reach the government's climate targets. Some will go to increasing the number of electric vehicle charging stations. For those who want to buy a battery powered car, there will be a boost in incentives. And one in five cars rolling off car lots will have to be zero emissions within four years, 100% by 2035. Because if you want to make the switch and you go to the dealership, you shouldn't have to be on a wait list. What this plan doesn't make clear is what cap will be imposed on the oil and gas sector and when. It makes up the biggest share of Canada's carbon footprint. We will be working with them over the coming months to ensure we put in place an appropriate cap that's going to work in a manner that will actually continue to employ people, but that will allow us to get at those emissions. The government projects the sector will only cut 31 percent of its emissions by 2030, but it will increase tax breaks for fossil fuel companies that use carbon capture technologies. Many say this plan cuts the oil patch too much slack. That means that other sectors, other workers, other consumers have to pick up its slack. There are a bunch of places that are still kind of vague, so you can't say with certainty that this will get us to our target. Canada has had at least 10 climate plans and set many different targets since the 1990s, but it hasn't met any of them. Unlike other plans, this one is legally binding, but it's not clear what the consequences would be if they don't meet the targets. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. In the United States, the FDA is authorizing a fourth dose of the COVID vaccine for anyone 50 and over. The highly contagious Omicron subvariant, BA2, is driving cases up. And with restrictions easing across Canada, there are questions about who should be eligible here and when. Christine Birak looked into it. With diabetes and trouble breathing, Heidi Schwendi wants another COVID shot. I would take a fourth dose any day, tomorrow if I could. U.S. health authorities now say fourth doses may be administered to individuals 50 years of age and older. In Canada, it's only immunocompromised patients over 12. Some provinces include residents in long-term care, and Quebec's now offering fourth doses to all seniors over 80. Where the evidence is strong, then a recommendation uh, is made. Researchers in Israel study the medical records of more than half a million seniors. Early results suggest the death rate from Omicron was 78% lower in those who received a fourth Pfizer dose compared with those who received just three shots. Experts say four shots may make sense for vulnerable seniors, but less than half of Canadians have even had three doses. Evidence is showing that the benefits of receiving a third dose compared to a second dose are more substantial than the benefits of receiving a fourth dose. An American study examining vaccine effectiveness of three shots against hospitalization found Moderna and Pfizer still offer nearly 80% protection four months later. It's something that people are clearly watching. Immunity from vaccines and natural infection will wane in the coming months, but experts insist three doses will still offer most Canadians strong protection over the summer. In my view, a lot of the, the necessity of the fourth dose is also going to have to do with how much SARS coronavirus 2 is circulating in the community. A surge in infections will likely happen in the fall when people move back indoors. Some doctors expect that is when fourth doses will likely be recommended for all Canadians. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. And we're going to pick up on the question about a fourth dose, who may need one and when, with the head of Pfizer. A conversation with CEO Albert Bourla a bit later in the program. Well, Canada's Gymnastics Federation says more needs to be done to protect athletes. It was responding to an open letter signed by a group of current and former gymnasts complaining of abuse. Today, in a statement, Gymnastics Canada said 
Many more supports must be in place to address unsafe practices, and it agreed with the athletes that an external and independent organization must be established to oversee complaints. Ottawa has previously announced plans for a new system to handle allegations of mistreatment in sport. Now, amateur hockey is dealing with its own reckoning. A new independent review of Canada's largest minor league, the Greater Toronto Hockey League, has found racism and discrimination. Thomas Daigle takes us through the findings. It may be considered Canada's favourite sport, but hockey doesn't make all Canadians feel welcome. Even in this amateur league, the biggest of its kind in the world, headlines about racist slurs on the ice forced management to self-reflect. I think the only way to make a change is to include more players of minority. In a new report, an independent committee found racism, sex and gender-based discrimination and inequality exist significantly within the Greater Toronto Hockey League at all levels. I want to say I was certainly disappointed by the extent that came to light. It's no surprise for families who've lived it. Let me know what needs to be washed. Just ask hockey dad Raheem Kareem about what his sons have been through. You know, there was a kid who said, look, you should, what are you doing here? You, you don't belong here. You should be playing basketball. You know, having to explain something like that is a little bit heartbreaking, right? Increasingly, players of color are speaking out like Akeem Alou exposing former Calgary Flames coach Bill Peters for a decade ago using the N-word. <laughs> Halifax goalie Mark Connors calling out other players for racial slurs just last year. Then in January, this. Subban wants to go with some money, Panetta mocking him. Jordan Subban saying his opponent made monkey gestures on the ice. Uh, Subban is furious here. Subban is one of three pro players in the family. Their father Carl helped write the new report. I never wanted them to stop playing the game because of the color of their skin or, or, or what someone said to them. Among the report's 44 recommendations, ensuring the league's board has more directors who are black, indigenous or people of color. In other words, ensuring those in charge better reflect the community beyond the rink in hopes everybody will one day feel welcome here. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. And a pro hockey owner is being remembered tonight. Eugene Melnick of the Ottawa Senators. We have to be mindful of the fact that he came in at a time when, you know, the things were looking pretty dire for the organization. They sat down one-on-one -on -one with him and had the opportunity to, to see his true side. You know, they see a different side than they see the side that I see in him. Melnick died Monday night from an undisclosed illness. His family says he faced it with determination and courage. Melnick had a liver transplant in 2015 after a public search for a donor. He had owned the senator since 2003 and is being remembered for his committed but complicated relationship with the team and its fans. Eugene Melnick was 62. Well, Queen Elizabeth makes a rare outing after recovering from COVID. But some are questioning why she chose to have Prince Andrew by her side. I think it's an image that's going to prompt a lot of uh, discussion, probably quite a lot of controversy and debate. Plus, trapped under rubble and wounded while driving, we speak to people who narrowly escape Russia's shelling. In one second, I lost everything, my parents, husband. But first, the indigenous delegations in Rome shocked by their visit to the Vatican museums. I saw artifacts that belong with our people. What they saw that made them uneasy. Next. Chaos and terror in suburban Tel Aviv today. Israeli officials say a gunman killed at least five people in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, the latest in a series of deadly attacks in that country. Video taken by a witness shows the gunman with an assault rifle. He was reportedly shot dead by police. At least 11 people have been killed in attacks across Israel over the past week. First Nations, Inuit and Métis delegations are meeting with the Pope this week. Today, they took a private tour inside one of the Vatican museums and saw some of their own cultural items. As Livia Stefanovic reports, many left disappointed and with unanswered questions. 
65 elders, indigenous leaders and youth shuffled their way through a line into the Vatican museums. They saw the masterpieces of Italian art, but also cultural belongings from their homelands. I saw artifacts that belong with our people, moccasins and jewelry. Some delegates finished the tour feeling uneasy. Something that I saw that sort of disturbed me was the sacred ceremonial pipe, the smoking pipe. That one there, I've been told by some elders that it's not for show. Norman Yakeula, a residential school survivor, is also concerned about how these important items ended up within the Vatican museums. They stole our souls, so we know that they steal. The Vatican says most of the artifacts are gifts given to the Pope. I think that really needs to be questioned. But this art history expert says there's evidence. Missionaries seized items for the Vatican's collection. So that's definitely stolen, stolen regalia and cultural belongings. During the tour, delegates saw a kayak from Anuvialuit, a pair of moccasins from British Columbia, and a baby belt from the Yukon. So I was really quite disappointed. That the president of the Métis National Council says she would like to see these items returned, but the Vatican is keeping its full catalog secret. One of the, the directors of the museum who was there kept talking about how they are the custodians of these items, that they don't belong to them, but they are the custodians of these items. And I, I just kept thinking to myself, well, why can't we be the custodians of our own items? With Indigenous communities still in the dark about the true extent of what the Roman Catholic Church possesses, delegates plan to continue pressing for the release of these precious cultural belongings long held behind the Vatican's walls. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Rome. Well, millions of Ukrainians are trying to escape Russia's constant shelling. Some are barely making out alive. How did you get out? I was under rubble calling for help. Coming up, stories of survival and tragic loss. Plus, it's impossible to discuss peace with someone who came to kill you. I speak with the Ukrainian MP, skeptical about Russia's desire for peace. Next. Well, negotiations seem to finally be going somewhere, but assuming peace is actually around the corner is dangerous. Russia has a bad track record when it talks, especially when it comes to talks, especially when it still has leverage. Now, remember that nuclear power plant that caught fire? It supplies a quarter of Ukraine's electricity, and Russia has it. It's blocked access to most of Ukraine's coastline, Mariupol included, which it continues to devastate. And Russia still has Kiev and several other cities in artillery range. Advantages it likely won't give up easily, even if it's negotiating in good faith. Well, joining us to talk more about the peace talks between Russia and Ukraine is Ivana klimpush senzadze She's a member of parliament in Ukraine, also currently in Washington, working to gain support for Ukraine, and soon she'll be headed to Ottawa. Uh, listen, I, you know, I've seen many characterizations of peace talks today as, as bearing signs of hope. But tell me, what do you sense in them? I do not see any sign of hope. Um, it's difficult to negotiate with someone when the uh, gun is being at your head. And um, as Golda Meir has said once, that it's impossible to discuss peace with someone who came to kill you. So Russia has a serious track record of lies and manipulations, even when it is conducting peace negotiations. So I think that Russia is using this negotiation uh, process right now as a smokescreen in order to regroup and to attack with the new um, power and additional rage uh, that he, it has been showing already across our country. Well, I was going to ask you, if not hope, then, then what? I mean, what the concern was, but your sense is that this is simply a diversion? Am I understanding you correctly? Uh, from my perspective, Russia is losing around Kiev, and that's why it is saying right now that it's going to withdraw. But at the same time, Kiev has been attacked several times today. So when Russia has already made that promise, that means that Russia didn't mean what it has been saying and is just using the time right now to 
uh, rearm its uh, troops and to ensure that it is actually attacking both Kyiv, Chernihiv and other cities, both in the north, east and south of Ukraine, as well as in the west, it has been doing by its uh, missiles. What would be a significant gesture, if not what it's doing now, that is to say it's signaling that it is prepared to stand down to some extent, what would be a significant gesture in your mind that could advance the state of talks right now? You know, I think that uh, some goodwill with even regard to uh, humanitarian corridors not being bombed, not being blown up, uh, that would be already some movement ahead. But we are having the problems to uh, to evacuate people from those siege cities and, and uh, uh, shelled on and pounded on cities at this particular moment. More than half of the million of Ukrainian people are waiting to be evacuated, and Russia is not providing for that opportunity. So here we go. That's a very, very humane thing to do, even during the wartime. Uh, but Russia is not willing to, to deliver upon that. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Canada's potential role in all of this, with, especially with your visit to Ottawa upcoming. What is it that, that you see as part of, in terms of Canada's part that it could play here? There, there is some talk about Canada perhaps becoming a guarantor of, of Ukraine's safety if things progress the way as intended. What's your sense of that? You know, I think that um, Canada has been already doing a lot in terms of helping Ukraine but a lot more could be done. And if that is one of the options on the table where Canada could step in with its guarantees, that would be a terrific news. But at this point, I don't think that we actually have had a clear public signal from Canadian government on readiness to do so. All right, we're gonna to have to leave it there, but thank you for making the time to join us. Ivana klimpush a member of parliament in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Now, no matter how or when this war ends, it has already left so many scars on cities and towns and on both the bodies and souls of survivors. Susan Ormiston spoke to two women recovering in Lviv. Their wounds severe, their memories almost unbearable. Olga Sairova is from Mariupol. Her home was destroyed by a Russian missile strike nearby. She made it to the basement. Her husband didn't. My husband was coming, but didn't make it. He needed five more seconds. How did you get out? I was under rubble, calling for help, but it took two hours for somebody to hear me. It took people from neighborhood homes six hours to dig me out. Her leg was trapped under a concrete slab. Neighbors wrapped rope around it and pulled it off with a car. Olga's leg is broken in three places. Her heart is shattered. She's angry, unbelieving. What can you think about the destruction of everything that was sacred and dear? In one second, I lost everything, my parents, husband. And after two days, I found out that my sister and her husband also died in their yard. Olga, I'm so sorry. She had to leave them all there under the rubble, no goodbyes. Mariupol is still under siege. Russian troops are closing in. 90% of the buildings are damaged or destroyed. The mayor says thousands have died or are injured. And the wounds from shrapnel are devastating, says Dr. Yuri Vovchko. These wounds have huge damage, torn and crushed soft tissue, and the time to heal is much longer. And these wounds are also infected, they take much longer to heal. Physical wounds like Olga's can heal. She goes into her first surgery tomorrow. She'll walk again. But the emotional trauma? So many are suffering. Meet Lesia. She's in Lviv now, recovering from her narrow escape from Hostomel near Kiev. When the bombing started, she grabbed nine month old Kira and jumped in a vehicle. It was shelled. The driver died, so did her friend.
Lucia's hand and wrist were nearly severed. I was very scared. You can't even imagine. I was trembling, afraid for my kids. You are thinking, oh my God, is this the end? With her baby and her friend's three-year-old, she headed down the road. Another driver picked them up, brought them to a home. Lucia almost bled out in the basement. She was calling her husband, save us. He was trapped by shelling trying to get an ambulance. I was losing consciousness and I was praying, Artyom, at least save our daughter. Artyom finally got to her. She was very white, I wanted to hug her, but I knew if I hugged her, she would start screaming. And this was around Kira? They show us the baby blanket which had been wrapped around Kira. It still has hard bits of shrapnel, some embedded in Kira's foot now. But they survived, together, in this senseless war that shows no real signs of ending. We will win for sure, because Putin is a terrorist. He's not fighting with soldiers, he's fighting with women and kids. Safe now in the Lviv area, they can't make plans, but Kira is their future, and they are grateful. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Lviv. Well, Queen Elizabeth stepped out in public today, appearing more frail since contracting COVID. But it is her son Andrew's presence that has people talking. Plus, this is only when the emotions really came, came, came out, and I had tears in my eyes. Pfizer's CEO reflects on the company's vaccine and whether he's open to sharing the formula with the developing world. Welcome back. As another wave of COVID sets in, there are conversations about the value of a fourth dose. But hard to believe that up until about a year and a half ago, there was no vaccine at all. We've come to learn plenty about Pfizer's monumental effort to produce a vaccine, but much less about the man in charge of it all. Now, company CEO Albert Borla has written a book called Moonshot, Inside Pfizer's Nine-Month Race to Make the Impossible Possible. And recently, I had a chance to speak with him. It was an incredible moment. Uh, I think I will remember it forever the most material information in the world at that moment. And uh, the results are astonishing. Only when uh, I went back uh, home that evening and I, I sat down and I took a glass of wine, this is only when the emotions really came, came, came out and I had tears in my eyes. In the early months of the pandemic, Albert Borla's team needed two miracles. First, a vaccine that actually worked using unproven technology, but they also needed it now. When I first heard the news, I thought I misheard. They told me 90 and I thought they told me 19. They said, no, 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 90. Then I said, but what is the efficacy? And then they told me 95.6. And then I knew that this is, the world is changing. Borla handled personally the calls with world leaders, all of whom wanted greater supplies of vaccine than the company could provide. In your book, you write about many different world leaders, and you speak highly, glowingly, of, of almost all of them, but notably not so highly of Donald Trump. Um, what should I read into that? I think in his mind you represented the best hope to bring a vaccine before the elections. And if we could, we would. Because for me, a, a week earlier, it is life saved. Uh, eventually, the vaccine came a week later. That frustrated him. So from uh, having excellent relations, uh, we had zero relations, because I think in his mind, we could have done it faster and we didn't. We never spoke since then. All vaccine makers have faced the same challenge, and that is of, of misinformation. C correct me if I'm wrong, but, I, but I, I believe I've heard you talk about those who would deliberately peddle in misinformation as criminals. Is, is that something that you stand by, that you believe in? Yes, I, I do, because they are, they are literally cost lives. They know what that they are saying is lying, but they do it despite that. There is an article, a picture of my wife, uh, her 
uh, I forced her to get the vaccine, and then because of the vaccine, she died. I realized that they had all of that lies, of course. And they did it. Why? Because they wanted to convince people that they were on the fence to do the vaccine or not. Don't do it. Look, his wife died. But forget that. That's nothing compared to how many people didn't do the vaccine and died because of that. So they are criminals. Another large problem, vaccine equity. Pfizer has sold primarily to wealthier countries. Its revenue during the pandemic doubled to $80 billion. Its profits up 50% in just one year. And so came the call for Pfizer to share its secret recipe. The intellectual property side of this. You know where I'm going with this. There have been repeated calls imploring Pfizer to share the formula with the rest of the world. Why has Pfizer decided not to do that? It was never a question of uh, intellectual property, why we didn't have enough vaccines in the first half of 2021. It was lack of raw materials, not, was not even infrastructure. We had built, and for those that they know even basic things about how sophisticated those technologies is, to say that uh, we can uh, transfer knowledge or we will have some countries in Africa start manufacturing this high tech, they are completely dreaming. This is not possible. Or is it? The World Health Organization is establishing a global mRNA hub in Africa with six countries set to receive the technology required to manufacture mRNA vaccines. Pfizer is also laying foundational groundwork in Africa, but only to produce its own vaccine. The vast majority of Africans have yet to receive even a single dose. There, there's an advocate who we've spoken to, an advocate for vaccine equity, but particularly in Africa. He has sort of a question about this, and I'm wondering if you could answer it. So let's go ahead and play this for you. My name is Edwin Ikwaria, and I'm the Africa Executive Director at the One Campaign. Mr. Albert Bola, Africa currently imports 99% of its vaccines. So why does Pfizer not support the regional hubs in Africa so that Africans can make their own vaccines for this pandemic and the next? No, I think he has a very fair point. And with mRNA, the question was something that had never been manufactured before in the world. We manufacture it at scale in the midst of a pandemic and trying to devote attention from the big centers that were making massive production for the whole world to try to do something in places that they don't manufacture even simpler forms that wouldn't be sustainable. So what is next? What does the next wave look like? What should we be preparing for? I mean, you know, there's a time when two doses was considered fully vaccinated. I have three. Will I need a fourth? What's next? I think what most of the people are asking right now, including the public and the experts, it is something that will last at least one year. I think there is a fatigue with, uh, I need to do an, a third or a fourth or a sixth. But we have good reasons to believe that we have found uh, good science that could lead us to this result. If that's true, I think we will be able to, to prove it in the next six to 12 months and then have something that uh, will, will take us for, uh, uh, for the years to come with just one annual revaccination. So a lot of activity right now, and uh, we are committed that we will never let go. Dr. Borla, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for your time. Uh, Excellent talk. Thank you very, very much. Have a nice day. Now, one other interesting footnote on the question of where else mRNA technology might lead the company. Before the pandemic even started, Pfizer was already in a partnership with that manufacturer, BioNTech, to create an mRNA flu vaccine. Just one of many applications of the technology that could hold promise. Okay, coming up, a more personal accomplishment. An Ontario musician's extraordinary road to Nashville. 
Plus, Queen Elizabeth shows support to Prince Andrew, and many are questioning her decision. Next. Police in the UK have issued 20 fines over illegal parties held by the Prime Minister and his staff during COVID lockdowns, with more fines likely to come. Individuals won't be named by police, but the Prime Minister's office said it would confirm if Boris Johnson gets a fine. Earlier this year, Johnson apologized to Parliament for mistakes made. Well, delayed almost a year by pandemic restrictions, a memorial service was held today for the late Prince Philip. The Queen was there in her first public appearance since testing positive for COVID. But as Ellen Morrow shows us, it was who she was with drawing much attention. Trumpeters signaling the Queen's arrival, a moment that had been in doubt. The 95-year-old monarch, increasingly frail, entered through a side door, using a walking stick escorted by her son, Prince Andrew. Her attendance only confirmed just before the service began. Westminster Abbey was full, hundreds there honoring the life of Prince Philip, the memorial that was impossible last year when he died. COVID restrictions then meant the Queen sitting secluded at Windsor Castle. Outside the Abbey, a crowd reflected on the moment. It kind of feels like the nation's grandparents, um, so it's just nice to be here for, for her today. I think obviously she'll be grieving and then she's got all that family problems, so she's going to be a lot upset, isn't she? One of those problems, the scandal around Prince Andrew. He recently settled a civil sexual assault case with Virginia Jufre, who alleged she was forced to have sex with him as a minor. Allegations Andrew denies, but his pride of place at the ceremony has been slammed by critics as offensive. I think it's an image that's going to prompt a lot of uh, discussion, probably quite a lot of controversy and debate. This royal commentator said it likely would have come down to the Queen's wishes. By having Prince Andrew so front and centre at this service, that won't be helpful in terms of the coverage. On the other hand, at what's already a time of turmoil for the royal family, the rift with Harry and Meghan not in attendance, questions about the monarchy's reach, with more countries poised to remove the Queen as head of state over Britain's brutal colonial legacy. So much to contend with in this, the Queen's platinum jubilee year, the first major milestone without Philip by her side. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, London. Well, the Foo Fighters have cancelled all remaining tour dates following the death of their drummer, Taylor Hawkins. The rock star was found dead on Friday during a tour in South America after complaining of chest pains. Taylor Hawkins was 50 years old. In a statement, the band says it is sorry for the disappointment, calling on fans to take this time to grieve. The Foo Fighters were scheduled to perform here in Canada between July and October. Well, after the break, the young trumpeter from Mississauga, Ontario, who landed an impressive gig after graduating from a very impressive school. Why he credits his achievement to the generosity of friends and strangers. Next. That is trumpeter William Leathers making headlines. Uh, four years ago, he was accepted to Juilliard, but needed some support to make the pricey tuition. Well. Thanks to some generous Canadians and strangers around the world, he crowdsourced tens of thousands of dollars. Now he's about to graduate, and he's already secured a pretty prestigious first job. His latest achievement and the people who helped make it happen are part of our moment tonight. Because of the generosity of uh, Canadians and people all over the world donating to my GoFundMe campaign, I was able to go to Juilliard for the first two years of my undergrad. And then afterward, I, uh, I was blessed with a, uh, a, a Cogner Fellowship at the Juilliard School, which covered the rest of my, uh, of my bachelor's. About a month ago, I uh, won the principal trumpet audition for the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. They invited me to play. 
So I went down there, went through three rounds of auditioning. After I played all three rounds, they informed me that they wanted me to be their next uh, principal trumpet player. Well, they certainly do call it Music City for a reason. You know, it's uh, there's a whole lot of uh, country music there, and there's a whole lot of pop music, and of course the, the the beautiful orchestra that I'm going to go play with. You know, I'm just ex really excited to get there. And none of that would have been possible without the generosity of uh, the people who don donated to the, to the campaign. You know, I'm not one to gush easily, but boy, that. That is outstanding. What an incredibly crisp, clean, full sound. Tuition for four years cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I suspect he'll make that back in spades. That's The National for this March 29th. Have a great night.